with a new perspective. But it does come down to sustainability. Certainly the most traditional, most widely accepted definition of sustainability is, is meeting the needs of the current generation while preserving the ability of future generations to meet their needs by the Brundtland Commission. I guess I say it a little bit differently, preserving the things that you can't live without and preserving them forever. But either way, sustainability is not about sustaining the way we do things today. Sustainability requires dramatic change in order to make us sustainable as a civilization. Um, for every minute that I'm speaking here, back in the US, three tons of the most toxic substances are being released directly to the air, water, and land. So it's not just a, a problem of perception, it's certainly a problem of reality. And the way that we've dealt with it is by more and greater regulations. Now these regulations have made the air, water, and land cleaner. The question we need to ask is this historic approach necessarily the most efficient way to achieve our environmental goals? And is it going to provide the innovation that will be required for sustainability? Because those regulations do come at a cost. Approximately $160 billion to the manufacturing sector alone. That was, to put that number in perspective, the entire <coughs> science and technology budget in the United States is about $140 billion. When you add it all up for all industrial sectors, it's about 2% of our GDP is devoted to that traditional approach. And so I come to Einstein, who always says it best, and that is that problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. And so what is this new level of awareness that uh, is being adopted? And this is the single one-sentence definition of green chemistry, the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. I do want to focus on the word design because it is the first statement of human intention and you cannot do design by accident. And so more than the, um, the fortuitous outcome or the tragic mistake, this is thoughtful design, understanding the methodologies, the metrics that you are trying to achieve as you engage in the design of chemical products and processes. Just want to mention that it does talk about the use and generation. So while green chemistry certainly can reduce waste and make the process more efficient, this is most certainly not where it ends. It looks at the entire life cycle from the origins of the feedstocks through all manufacturing, through use and to the end of its useful commercial life. And so it is about as broad a perspective as one can get. So there are distinctions between the way that we have used very elegant technological bandages in order to make our polluting toxic processes a little bit less bad into this new approach, this new level of awareness, and that is innovations-based, solutions-oriented, rather than simply studying, or I often say admiring the problem, advancing competitive, competitiveness rather than hindering innovation, and systematic sustainability. Now I'm not going to go through the 12 principles of green chemistry because I can tell you that that takes at least a semester. But if I were to to talk about these, we would talk in terms of reducing intrinsic hazard, talk about using renewable feedstocks, biodegradable products, energy efficiency, making sure that pollution prevention and accident prevention work hand in hand, and by the end of that description, by the end of that description, we, you would be saying, well, Paul, that is common sense. The problem is that common sense is not particularly common because it bears very little resemblance to how we do things today. Somewhere around 95% of the products that we make are, synthetic products that we make are based on depleting feedstocks from petroleum. We know that everyone in this room has bioaccumulating substances building up uh, in their body. And we know that we often deal with 
issues of uh, sabotage or terrorism at our chemical sites by using guns, guards, and gates rather than changing the intrinsic nature of the chemistry that's used in our facilities. So are the 12 principles of green chemistry common sense? Yes, they are. Is common sense particularly common? Not at this time. So it is a change in thinking. Change in thinking moving from the circumstantial to the intrinsic. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that we have often dealt with these issues by trying to change the circumstances or the conditions that we use our substances. We change the way that we transport them. We change the, the personal protective gear, having people wear goggles and respirators and gloves. We put smokestack scrubbers on smokestacks and treatment on, on effluent. And all of these attempts at reducing risk by reducing exposure have two things in common. One, they all can, and as a probability function, will fail. And when they fail, the risk goes to its maximum because you haven't addressed the hazard side of the equation. Second, they all necessarily have to be a cost drain. They have to be costly. They cannot add performance. They cannot add efficiency. They cannot add capabilities to the products or the processes. By contrast, by redesigning the intrinsic nature of the transformations of the chemicals themselves, at the same time that you are imparting this green perspective of making them less toxic and less harmful, you can add new efficiencies, new capabilities, new performance, and that is the, the secret that so many of the visionaries in industry are seeing, that they are getting both of these advantages at once. Not only in one part of the life cycle, for instance, waste in manufacturing, but by looking at it broadly and looking at the 12 principles as a cohesive system that is mutually reinforcing. This is the engine of innovation that leaders in green chemistry are seeing. And so, yes, green chemistry can reduce risk by reducing exposure as well. But the real power, the real innovation, is when you are reducing the intrinsic hazard by thoughtful design. And why is this possible? Why is this possible that we're even talking about green chemistry today in 2009? It's because we are standing on the shoulders of giants, that we no longer just know that something is toxic. Over the decades, science has taught us why things are toxic, how they act in the body, and now we have the molecular understanding that's necessary for this future design. We'll talk a lot more about that in coming sessions. So let's go through a few examples that uh, my, my friends in the biomimicry community might, uh, uh, might enjoy, uh, which is one great tool in the green chemistry toolbox. We use the examples of it, adhesives and plastics that are made through uh, toxic, uh, through toxic processes now, and yet we look at the, at the examples in nature of the muscle who does this at, uh, using non-toxic processes. We look at the example of how we use adhesives and the, the warnings that we have on our adhesives because of toxicity and always used in a well-ventilated area and yet we use the example of the gecko adhering to the, uh, 